Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kevin Stankovic, Adult Programming Librarian at the Northside Library. And on behalf of the Jefferson Madison Regional Library, the Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society, and the creators of Seabellpedia, we welcome you to this hybrid program, Ancestral Monarchy and Homeland with Professor Jeffrey Hamden. Whether you are watching remotely via Zoom or if you are here in person tonight, uh, thank you so much for joining us for this very special event. If you know of anyone who could not make tonight's program, it is being recorded for inclusion on JMRL's YouTube channel. Um, we'll also be sharing it with the Historical Society as well. Uh, barring any technical difficulties, um, JMRL hopes to have it posted within the next couple of days. As a courtesy to this evening's presenter, we ask that all questions please be saved for the end of the program, uh, where we will designate time for Q&A. For those watching via Zoom, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A um, or the chat box, either or. Additionally, for those joining us remotely, the closed caption transcript has been turned on tonight. You can activate this feature by selecting live transcript at the bottom of your screen and enable subtitles. Please note, despite the prompt you might receive, you cannot save or download the transcript, and the transcription is by no means flawless. Um, and with that said, to get us started, I would now like to turn things over to Tom Chapman. Tom is the Executive Director at the Almoro Charlottesville Historical Society. Tom? Thank you, Evan. Appreciate that. Um, as he said, my name is Tom Chapman, the Executive Director for the Almoro Charlottesville Historical Society. Excited to be here for this first hybrid program, um, combining an in-person program here at Jefferson Madison Regional Library, Northside Branch, um, along with an online program for all of you out there somewhere. Um, I'd like to thank the people at Northside Library, Evan Stankovitz and the Jefferson Madison uh, folks for hosting our program, all their help in making this program possible. Um, I wanna thank Professor Hantman for joining us and his willingness to jump into this hybrid experiment, appreciate it. Um, for those here in person, remember after the presentation this evening, we'll also have a Seabillpedia tutorial, which will be in the computer lab, right? Right, yeah, yeah there's, so, know, registered. there's a couple of spaces still available, um, but the room was full up right now. Okay. So everyone who signed up, plus we have a few more spaces, so there'll be some folks coming in shortly and helping us with that later. Um, although it is not required, uh, we encourage everyone in attendance here and out there in the virtual realm uh, to become a member of the Historical Society. Your support helps us produce this speaker series and produce all of our free programs um, that help connect us with our local history. Um, you can sign up on our website for our newsletters, um, sign up to receive our email, um, be, be a part of our email list. Um, and with those housekeepings, um, Evan mentioned we'll have the Q&A period at the end, so we'll good. Um, our speaker tonight, as I said, is uh, Professor Jeffrey Hinton. He is Professor Emeritus in the Anthropology Department at the University of Virginia. Uh, he is an anthropological archaeologist who conducts research in the eastern United States, principally in the Chesapeake Bay, Middle Atlantic region. Um, and he has a long-term interest in the history of the Monacan Native American people of Virginia. Uh, the title of his presentation this evening is Ancestral Monacan Homelands Along the Seminole Trail. And I uh, apologize we didn't get it up into our earlier promotional material, but it would be a point of emphasis in terms of what Professor Hampton will be talking about, because he's looking at not only the history, but also how um, a new emphasis on Monacan targeted eugenics and the not naming of places in the region. Uh, hence, Monacan versus Seminole. Um, he will discuss specific places in Charlottesville and, Al Charlottesville and Albemarle that are central to understanding indigenous history. Uh, these places are the ancestral homeland of the Monacan Indian nation. And with the present day, looking at the legacy of colonial and eugenics eras in Virginia, help explain how and why the Monacan name rarely appears along the path of the curiously named Seminole Trail. Professor Hampman has received the Monacan Tribal Association Award for Contributions to Monacan Culture, the Virginia Social Science Association uh, Anthropology Scholar of the Year Award, the University of Virginia's All-University Teaching Award, the Distinguished Faculty Award from the Hillel Student Association, and served on several state boards and commissions. And before I introduce Professor Hampman, I want to also recognize an award 
um, that he received this past February, but this is the first time we had the opportunity to meet in person. The Charlottesville, uh, Arbor Charlottesville Historical Society's Publications Committee unanimously awarded Professor Hantman the Jane Moore Essay Award for his essay, Eugenicist, Sentimentalist, Activist, Social Theory at the University of Virginia, 1926 to 1960. And that is found in our magazine of Albemarle County History, the 2018-2019 version. Um, the committee recommend, recognized Hantman's essay breaks new historiographical ground through his specific focus on faculty at UVA who challenge eugenics thinking, placing his work in a national context, he is able to show that eugenics did not go unchallenged. So I wanna thank Professor Hantman, congratulations for a great um, essay, uh, with small appreciation of our, um, of our small token of our appreciation. And considering the topic of this evening's presentation, we know we'll see your uh, in-depth and in-depth analysis of our local history and another example of how your work is breaking new ground to challenge our past assumptions. So with that said, please welcome Professor Hantman, um, the in-person and the online podium is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it is an honor to be here and speak to the society. Um, and it was an honor to be published in your excellent journal and to receive that award meant a great deal to me. And this talk is, <clears throat> has two pieces. The first is to address the question of what do we mean by monic and ancestral homelands? You, 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 you probably hear land acknowledgments at UVA and the county meetings and city meetings and the acknowledgement that although the Monacan people today are based in Albemarle County, I'm sorry, in Amherst County, uh, over 2,100 people on their tribal roles, their ancestral historic territory uh, included certainly Albemarle and the city of Charlottesville, but there's very little recognition of that. And I don't want to speak to that. There's very little um, visual recognition of that. And uh, their territory extended beyond that. Um, I've got a lot to say in the, this. So there's two pieces to this talk and it's a 90 degree turn midway. The first is what do I mean by ancestral territory? And how do we know what Monacan ancestral territory was? and is because that term is present day. Uh, Monica people are well aware of where their ancestors were buried and what was their ancestral homeland that they were displaced from when English colonists came in. And the second half of the talk is about is continuation of the article I published uh, with the society, with the journal, which is the effect and long lasting and painful legacy of the eugenics movement uh, in Virginia, and I'll, I'll give some definitions on that. So let, let me start with uh, ancestral Monacan territory. And um, I'm going to move quickly because the good news is I think a lot of people have heard this already. The Monacans are federally recognized. Um, <clears throat> we can move on. Uh, and their presence in Virginia and their territory has been recognized by the federal government, by key agencies of the federal government, including the Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Committee, which rules on when human remains are found, who do they belong to, and the territory over which Monacan ancestors were buried, and who are still remembered by contemporary Monacans is quite vast. Most of the Piedmont. I don't need this at this distance. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Yes, I still have a mustache. <laughs> We're back to the 1970s. Can't lose it. Um, in any case, this territory is well known to the Monacan people. Um, so, by way of uh, introduction, a, a cultural geography of Virginia at 1607. And it's important to say that because this is this map based on contemporary 
GIS available maps and uh, county boundaries, but it's familiar to you, shows the major uh, Native American groups that were known when the English came to Virginia, and more than that were known that were recorded by the legendary nefarious, sometimes crazy, sometimes incredibly insightful John Smith, the Jamestown colonist who uh, mapped the, uh, the Virginia when the first colony was established. Um, John Smith had uh, took a, a Monacan man captive uh, at the fall line of the Rappahannock River, which was part of larger Monacan territory. Most of you can talk about the James and the Rivanna, but the Rappahannock was part of Monacan territory. John Smith and some English uh, explorers charged by the Virginia Company back in London with getting upstream, getting into the mountains, finding out where the commodities were, Enough, I mean, the shellfish were not, shell uh, captured from the Chesapeake was not going to, did not have a market in England. And the reason for the English being here, of course, was profit. Tobacco had not begun yet, tobacco farming and trade. But they, the English knew there were minerals in the mountains. And so John Smith and the colony were charged with getting into the interior. Uh, so Smith headed up the Rappahannock River and then up the James. In both cases, he was rebuffed, turned back at the fall line. In one case, he stopped and, and uh, engaged in a bullets for arrows exchange. Uh, and uh, it was short lived, but they took one uh, Monacan, the English took one Monacan man at the fall line of, uh, at the falls of the Rappahannock River, modern day Fredericksburg, beautiful spot. And they took one man captive there. This man's name was Amarolek. And John Smith said to Amarolek, who are you and who are your people? And that's what this map represents. Amarolek said, I am of the Monacan people who are further upstream for the most part. I also know the Powhatans who live on the coastal plain. And I know the people further to the west who are uh, under different names to Amarolek, but you would recognize as Cherokee, the ancestors of the Cherokee. And further west, and, and identified by Amarillo as someone who, a group that was feared with a mass of Womax. Mass of Womax are most likely uh, the Erie Indians who lived along the Great Lakes and are Iroquoian people. And uh, so the mass of Womax, there's not a lot of fear of the Powhatans, despite all the talk you hear in Disney films and textbooks and popular histories. Monacans did not, they, they were back and forth with the Monacans on equal terms. Massawomax seemed to present some pressure. And then the English provide some new pressures after a while. Uh, across the mountains, the Cherokee, not a lot of interaction. Those rivers flow to the Mississippi, the Clinch and Powell rivers of Southwest Virginia, and rivers being the highways and the railroads and the interstates of the day. They dictated much of the interaction crossing the fall line better than Smith was able to. So that's the larger geography. And I, we're going to zoom in on what was Monacan. You see it's a sizable territory. I don't have a pointer with me, but that's a sizable territory. And I'll show you a map soon with familiar geography of just how large ancestral Monacan territory was uh, for the people who today are based in Amherst. The next, please. And I will try to pick up the pace. This is what's known and uh, always sold in every park service bookstore everywhere. This is the John Smith map of Virginia. I call it the John Smith and Amarolic map. Uh, I don't know how much time I have uh, left to change the world's title for this map, but 50% of what John Smith put on this map came from Amarola. John Smith took him captive and said, who are you? Who are the people you live with? And, and what are the names of the towns? And where are they exactly? And so once this, the, the mapping tradition of the time was that north is this way. Here's the Chesapeake Bay. Jamestown is on the James. And going up the map is going west. And Amarolek is the source. So a native person from the Piedmont 
who knew Charlottesville as it was then, who knew Fredericksburg, who knew Orange County, who knew Nelson County, et cetera, and all their towns. He gave this information to Smith, and it holds up to this day. Now, of course, it's not GPS uh, markings here, but we know where these places are. They're big towns, and they're identifiable by the sheer density of pottery and stone tools and, and food remains and evidence of houses that are in the ground. I'll show you examples of that. Um, all of this is Monacan territory. Smith is not shy to use large fonts to say this is Powhatan territory. And up there is Monacan territory in the red box. And I've given you a blow up of it here. And I, as archeologists, my students and I, and in, and in collaboration with the Monacan tribe have excavated at two of these places, Manasukapanaw and Manahasanaw. This is the Rivanna, and that's a longhouse indicating that a chief's village or a king's house in John Smith's words was located there. That's Charlottesville, 1607, 1608, clear up to 1730, Manasukapanaw. It's on the SOLs now. Every school kid knows it. I don't see a lot of school kids here tonight. So if this is new to you, this is Charlotte. Monahassanaw, I've had a chance to dig at. Um, that's uh, in Nelson County on the James and um, near the modern town, or really a market and some houses, a general store and a post office, Wingina on the James, the Batchel Festival stops there. That's where that is. In the middle, at the point of Forks, where the Rivanna and the James separate is the chiefest of the Monacan towns, which is Rasswick. And that's been in the news quite a bit lately because a, um, a water authority that was organized in Louisa and Savannah County uh, planned to build a pump station right in the heart of Rasswick, the chiefest town, a sacred place. Chiefs towns are often associated with large burial complexes. The Monaghan people objected and they frankly seem to be winning. Uh, nothing, uh, the fight with the water planners and the Corps of Engineers, which US Army Corps of Engineers, which takes no position, but is watching it, has authority here. I, uh, we can talk about that later. So these are the, every one of these has a long house Icon and the icon means King's House, John Smith's words, Amarolic Chief's House. The chiefest of them to which others pay tribute is Mass uh, Rasselwick. Then there are two very close to Richmond, Masinikak and Mohemcho. Uh, this is a King's House and that's an ordinary house. It's once you get here, look at the density of ink because John Smith uh, traveled there. He had Powhatan guides and he, he by boat and by foot traveled about the, the coastal plain and identified 200 Powhatan villages. It's an unfortunate, unfortunate legacy of this map that people think, well, there were thousands and thousands, 15,000, 17,000 Powhatan people look at and 200 villages. And once you get into the Piedmont Mountains, it's like, hmm, nobody's home. Wrong. John Smith says explicitly, there are these places that Amarola told me about. They are king's houses. They are organized hierarchically. These other king's houses, these other chief's houses pay tribute unto Razzle, the cheapest of them all. And there are diverse others. So in 2021, diverse has a very uh, sharp and particular meaning, an important meaning, but pick up your handy pocket Oxford English Dictionary. I'm sure we're all carrying one. Well, you can get it online, so if you have your cell phone. Anyway, uh, when John Smith said diverse, when any Englishman said diverse in 1607, 1608, 1612, when these were published by Oxford University Press, this map was the first secular text published by Oxford University Press, the map and a description of the, the people of Virginia, diverse meant so many, I can't count them. <laughs> and so the map is not, it's, it's very helpful, but it's an un unfortunate representation of the balance of power and settlement 
there's a lot of people living along the James. This is all in, this is just a part of ancestral Monacan territory that was lived in in 1607. Sorry, I need to, I've taken the Smith Amarolic map and you know, with the help of a, a good cartographer, put it on contemporary geography for you. Uh, so here's Richmond, here's Charlottesville, Montsoupinard right there. In other words, just two miles above uh, where the city is today. Here's the chiefest town of Rastawick. So this is what's familiar to you, what we just talked about, filling the James, filling, going up the Rivanna, and then the, the Monacan towns on the Rappahannock, which are just as numerous. Smith was an honest guy on this map. You have these iron crosses, as people call them. And those iron crosses were icons where Smith said, up to this point, I traveled and everything I've mapped is what I saw. Beyond this point is by relation only. So we're dependent on Amarolek, who I trust, who has been tested out, and archeology span and oral history. And so we turn to the archeology span to flesh, to, to give more substance to the diverse, which is so many, you can hardly count, Monacan villages that were out there, although we start, I start with the towns, the chief's towns that are identified. <laughs> we okay? okay? So we can, um, now a, a key feature is where the, the James and the, and the uh, Rappahannock hit the falls and, many, and the Potomac, of course, as well. Many of you, I hope, have had the chance to visit the falls of the Potomac, Great Falls of the Potomac, the Great Falls of, of Fredericksburg and, uh, and Richmond. Beautiful places, but they impede uh, movement. And they, did, they didn't impede trade. They didn't impede, impede marriage relations, connections, kinship ties, but it's difficult to travel. The Indians knew how to do it, the English didn't. And so they never went above the falls. Their boats were too heavy and Smith stayed pretty much to the east side. Made one little trip. I don't believe, tell you the truth, the story for another day, I don't believe he made this trip. A lot of pressure from the profit-oriented Virginia company to visit a Monacan town. Smith and Christopher Newport tiptoe, they say, to Massinica. So they visited a Monacan town, they mapped it, and here's what they wrote after like pages and pages and pages about Paspahe and where Wakomako, all the chief's towns in the Powhatan region. They say, we reached Masinicac, the people treated us neither ill nor well. We did some testing for gold and copper, finding none, we turned and returned to Jamestown later that night. To me, that's, I'm not going. I'm not, I, we're not going. And the Powhatan guys are always saying, we can't go now, but we'll take you tomorrow morning. And then tomorrow morning rolls around like, mm, yeah, Monacans, they're mean. They could just <laughs> fall of the leaf and they invade us. So probably not, maybe tomorrow. And every morning Smith shows up or Christopher Newport, Gabriel Archer to keep players in the early colony. <laughs> and every time they're like, I don't know, Monacans, they're, you know this term savage you all use for us? That's what we call those people. <laughs> and it just keeps going down the line. And, and really they're very similar. They speak different languages, they have slightly different histories, but hierarchical chiefdoms, complex, powerful. Uh, the English always say they were forever at war. Um, archaeologists from Thomas Jefferson, who was the first archaeologist in America, to my students that work with, that have been allowed to work with human remains uh, in a respectful way will report that there's no evidence, there's almost no evidence of death by uh, blunt trauma, such as you, or uh, an arrow point in the skull or chest or whatever. Um, the talk of warfare is greatly exaggerated by the English. The next one, please. Um, a defining trait of, you've seen the, the, the roadmap for the Monacans. Uh, of course, they built their houses out of uh, saplings and thatch. These, these do not last, they don't preserve above ground. I'll show you evidence of them below ground. 
one feature that does, that almost preserved above ground, that defines Monacan ancestral territory fundamentally are what um, Jefferson and his contemporaries who wrote about the Monacans and notes on the state of Virginia uh, refer to as ancient monuments. If by ancient mon, he, he qualifies that, he's writing to uh, English and French scientists. He says, um, when I say monuments, I'm not, I don't mean like Pompeii, I don't mean Stonehenge, I don't mean the great barrows, which are uh, burial mounds and astronomical features in Northern Europe, England, in Scotland, England, Germany, Sweden. Um, I don't mean those exactly, but these are really impressive features of human labor and they are sacred. I've seen people visit them and they are community cemeteries. He dug into one. That's a big, we could spend an hour. Jefferson always, on both sides of every, every issue, he did this scientific work. It lives today. He knew it was a sacred site. Why did he disturb it? Uh, we'll come back, we can come back to that. Um, none of the, this is a statement about Virginia in the 19th century and 20th century. Uh, Colonists, early settlers did not respect these places. They pushed them down. They were in rich agricultural fields and they were all pushed down. That's why bizarrely in the middle of my talk, I, I found the closest mound I know in all of the Eastern United States and Arkansas. That's probably what the, a mound looked like. It, it had this conical shape, could have been as much as six, well, Jefferson tells us the one he excavated right on the South Fork of the Rivanna. So close to here, we could walk over if you felt like it Not now. Um, but it's pretty much what they look like. And then when the Monacan people moved away, when the colonists came up out of this uh, rich uh, cemetery, the cemetery that was soil and human remains, and that's it. That's a rich organic context. And trees, large trees grew up out of them. TJ dates the trees, dates the mounds. The first person to say, this is a community cemetery and its, its height is a function of its use over time. They buried dozens of people at one event, they covered them over, then they collected bodies, kept them out of the ground and put them into the ground and they covered them over and they buried more and they covered them over. These are the, are all around the globe, mortuary, treatment, mortuary rituals, and a real distinctive marker, isn't it, or it has been, of uh, religious practice and identity. And for the, the Powhatan people and the Cherokee people did not make mounds like this. The Massawomacs did not make mounds like this. The Monacans did, and there were 13 of them. They looked like that. This one's from Arkansas, but of all 13, there are Boy Scout troops and amateur associations, and flooding and the plow, the farmers who just said that damn mound is making it hard for us to plant our wheat, plant our tobacco, let's just push it down. Well, what about the human remains? Well, that frankly was good, enrich the soil, it's fertilizer. Pretty despicable, really, if you think about it. Um, that all came to an end in the 20th century. I, for what it's worth, I, I'm 100% convinced that Jefferson did not keep human remains. He looked at them and returned them to the mound. He did see, we'll talk in a minute, but he did observe Monica people conduct sacred, uh, sorrowful rituals on the mound in Charlottesville. Now, where are these 13 mounds? Next slide. Here they are on this map. Uh, every English language or English looking word you see there. Uh, obviously we don't have Monacan names for the mounds, but this is, here we are in Charlottesville, that's the mound just by here. And then every other, there's one on the uh, Rapidan River, which gets named for the river, the Rapidan, and over to the Shenandoah, across the Blue, into the Blue Ridge, in Lewis Creek is in modern day Stanton, and they know it. Uh, Hayes Creek is in Rockbridge County. When, when I show you this map, connect the dots. 
that's ancestral Monacan territory from about 900 AD till the late 1700s and to the present because Monacan people know where they, these mounds were. And the Native American Graves Protection Committee that oversees repatriation agrees that any remains found from these places are returned to Amherst County today, to the historic Monaghan Cemetery. So this map is a map of religious practice, and to me it defines ancestral Monaghan territory. It's quite a wide area. I'll show it to you in a modern map in a minute. Um, in the midst of these mounds, and not, by, not coincidentally, wherever you see the letter C, going right down the middle, those are copper mines. Copper was the object of desire for the elite who lived on the coast. As much as we honor Chief Powell, and I don't want to put him down, if man uh, established the great pan-tribal, uh, not a confederacy, but a, a, a large chiefdom under his own authority, but to to display his authority, he needed copper. There's no copper in the coastal plain. Where did Chief Powhatan and his petty chiefs, where did they get their copper? Where the seas are. Where are the seas? They're in Monacan territory. The other rare mineral that was traded across the fall line and into the mountains, and as far south as Georgia and as far north as Pennsylvania, and we know this from chemical testing, is, is soapstone, steatite. And if you know Albemarle's history, you know this is the great steatite belt that was industrially mined in recent years, still is. And uh, the Monacans were mining soapstone and trading soapstone bowls, bowls carved out of this soft rock uh, that preceded the production of pottery. And those bowls were used as soapstone is today for stoves and things. They, were, they held fire and they held fire safety. So I think, I'm sure they were ritual items. That's Monacan ancestral territory. It's the geography of the places and uh, the sacred places, which are the mounds. The mounds are typically associated with a chief's village. These villages are maybe 150, 200 people. They're not enormous and neither were the Palatine villages. This was the uh, Native American. Eastern Woodland Native Organization. Um, there you see John White, who was the Englishman, the naturalist at uh, the English colony of Roanoke in 15 to fail, the famous failed or lost or disappeared. I love that term, disappeared. How they do this? David Copperfield was brought in and he made the people. <laughs> so, anyway, that was the chief there at Roanoke and he's wearing copper. See that around his chest. That's what it took. That made him a jeep. That copper comes from the mountains of North Carolina and uh, Monica country. That's a soapstone bowl, somewhat fractured. Um, these things were valued at huge value. So there's the ancestral territory. Some of the reasons why it was tremendously significant before the English arrived picture, there's people living on the coast, they don't have any of these rare minerals. They got plenty of shellfish, but they don't have these things that are valued all across the continent. The Monacans were the middlemen. They were in a position of power to negotiate trade and they had their own sources. So I, there's so much to be said about the Monacans and it's not, I've written about in a book I published three years ago now and in many academic articles before that, how important that was. And that's the map. Next one. On a current, on a contemporary uh, Virginia map, most of my colleagues just go, oh, Ham, that's crazy. You know, you look at that map, I'm so used to it and I'm so right. Will you give me that? <laughs> uh, you don't have to. But when you just draw an arbitrary circle where the Mounds are, that's it. So it's from Richmond, from the fall line. This was a D, what uh, some people started calling a DMZ, demilitarized zone, about a 20 kilometer 
uh, space between Palatine territory and the Monacans. So Monacan territory goes right up to here. Chief Palatine had a big storage house there where he, his tribute was stored, it's called Aurapax. Um, and then you cross Windsor into Goochland, Louisa, Cumberland to Banner, Buckingham, Charlottesville, Albemarle Nelson, into the mountains, into the Ridge and Valley. That's where the mounds are. That's where the copper is. That's where the soapstone is. This is Monacan country. It's pretty sizable. This is Monacan ancestral territory on a map I think you would all recognize. It's been a fight for 40 years to get people to agree. Um, you could debate the symbolic and political meaning of the mounds. Um, so when I say I'm right, I also will, I'm happy to acknowledge that others may disagree. <laughs> <laughs> and again, uh, when human remains came out of Augusta County and Rockbridge County, in the past two decades, I worked with the, collaboratively with the tribe and took the case to the national committee that evaluates what do you do with unmarked remains. There's no headstones, there's no, these people were buried without burial furniture, as archeologists say, no. The distinctive feature was how they were buried. We took our case, the Monacan people took their case and they helped write it, and this was all Monacan. And we were rejected on the first term. The, the Native American Review Committee, the Grave Protection and Repatriation Committee is by law, uh, has majority Native American makeup, people mostly from the West, Native people from the West. And one by one they said, yes, yeah, it's interesting, but we don't, we don't know this name Monacan. We don't know these people. Uh, you're going to have to come back with some more evidence. So we went to work. And we came back with all the evidence and some pretty heavy hitters and and Indian movement political activists who were appointed to this board said, it's a good case. And the human remains from as far away as Orange, Augusta, Bath, Rockbridge are here today, buried in ritual practice that I was not allowed to see, so I can't tell you anything about it. But, um, and that, that's fine. I, I, what I do, and we work together, and there's some things I'm not privy to. The next one, please. I'm gonna have to pick up the pace. I just wanna show you that what the archeology span has shown and how different it is. It's a challenge working in Piedmont and the mountains because the rivers flood like crazy. And, and they didn't always. The Indians weren't stupid. They didn't live in flood water. But development upstream, damming of rivers, et cetera, has created flooding deposits of soil and a grading of soil. And you never know what you're going to get. Plows turn things up. And anyway, we, I knew from the old maps this was this region, this beautiful cornfield along the James at the southern end of Nelson uh, was Monahassanaw and we excavated it. It's just one season, it takes like five seasons of digging that space. And it's that close to the surface, a couple of inches down because floodwaters carry things away. What you see is, you know, it's not Pompeii, it, not in its visual in the 21st century, but you see a lot of little dots here. That's where saplings were in the ground, where the structure that people lived in. These are storage pits, trash pits, hearths. The next slide, moving along. Um, once we put it on a line, you know, a line drawing, uh, we saw that we had five houses just in that spot, all lived in with 1,200, 1,300, 1,400. More recent than that was washed away. The more recent artifacts were in the plow zone where the plow would turn things up, but the houses and features were destroyed by flooding. But it's very organized. Here's a house. Here's its storage pit. Here's a house. Here's its storage pit. There's a house. 
There's a storage pit. How storage pit, how storage pit. It's, it's a comp, it's a way of life. And what's interesting is the Monaco people, uh, if you notice for the most part, the storage areas are outside the houses. Anthropologists worldwide do a lot with that. Is, is surplus food kept inside the house, kept secret? Or is it outside and anyone can share or it's not kept as a secret? And we see the Monicans at this point that storage units are outside. Now, what's that storage for? It's next season seed corn. And it's also probably the, the surplus that was paid as tribute to uh, Rasur, the chiefest town, which would have exacted some payment, not necessarily exploitative, I don't see much evidence for that, but nevertheless, tribute was paid as it was paid to Chief Powhatan to the east to the town of Rasselwick. That's why people care so much about Rasselwick. The next one we'll pick up. Um, the, the, the line drawings we've done are actually the basis of the reconstructed houses of the Living History Monica Museum at the Natural Bridge. That's a uh, Monacan style house with the outside features here, the hearth, the Ramada type covering, and a village that's actually the um, Powhatan village, but National Geographic came in and did a beautiful drawing of what a village might look like, commoners houses and then chiefs houses. You see the chiefs houses are long houses in the back, the commoners are living uh, close to the river. So the archaeology, I don't do this kind of work, but Monica Museum people do, and the National Park Service is now jumping in and doing it uh, at Wero Comico. So you'll be able to see uh, better than uh, we can see in the dirt what these towns look like. A lot more work to go into that. Next, please. Um, in the year, in 1999 2000, the Saka organization of Charlottesville uh, was given a gift of flat land along the South Fork of the Rivanna. Uh, soccer players need flat land. Uh, the County Board of Supervisors, to their great credit, said, wait a minute, the Monacan people lived along and farmed the flat land of the South Fork of the Rivanna. And so Sally Thomas and other members then of the Board of Supervisors and the administrators for the soccer organization of Charlottesville, Bill Mueller. I give him great praise. Bill, I said, Bill, I don't know. I don't, the county wants me to, wants the university and my students and I to look into whether your soccer fields are going to disturb a sacred site. And first we have to find out whether flooding and other plowing has left the site there at all. And if it's there, is going to be a discussion. And that discussion took place. Uh, the SACA organization under Bill Mueller, Dan Rosenzweig, who's now with Habitat for Humanity, uh, they said, you know, we're about soccer and we're about education for our kids and we'll do what's right. This is really amazing. Savannah and Louisa are not there yet. But that was a great moment. So uh, we, we volunteered our time. It's a great experience for the students. That's what I say. They say they were terribly exploited. <laughs> um, we paid those we could. Some got credit. Uh, anyway, this is Montesukapanon. It's contemporary with Montesukapanon, and it's it's associated with the mound Jefferson talks about. Uh, we never got near the mound. We stayed in the village side. And you can that picture of the woman with the um, tape measure, right? You can see right now, here we have to go deep, digging down, down, down. And then just four quick shots, one test pit, then two test pits, then three test pits. And then my job at my age and my condition is to come in and say, okay, knock down the walls between the test pits. And then I get the hell out of there. And that's what's happening here. Uh, so it's very slowly, test, test, we found the 17th century component, which was identified by this very dark soil, flat-lying stones, floods don't leave flat-lying stones, but people do. If there was a surface there, 1600, 1700, 
stones will be lying flat. And the flood soils are up here, they're very fine grained, they're undifferentiated. And then you get into the stained soil where people dropped food remains, where, where plants grew, where houses decayed. And that turns the soil dark. And so it's not a mystery. It's not, it's not easy. But when you reach that occupation level, you know it. And that's what we did. So the next slide is not very pretty because it's not a reconstructed village. If we could go to the next one. When you knock the walls down, here it is again. These are where the saplings were for the houses, storage pits, uh, trash pits, hearths, more post holes. See the dark, that's flood. Uh, where it's dark running up and down is where bushes had been and carried moisture deeper into the ground, but it's at flat level, uh, several feet below the ground surface. And we got down there. And what we were able to do was say, okay, right here, this is this is Montesupino. This is the chief's town as associated with the burial mound is sacred to the Monacan people. A little to the east, a little to the west, a little to the south, flood waters have just carried it away. So can you turn your soccer fields this way? Can you take an adult field and make it a children's field? Can we compromise? They they did. And I think it's a it's a very positive statement about the Board of Supervisors in Saka that we were able to do that. So again, not a beautiful shot, but when we reconstruct, when we get an artist's reconstruction, we'll have an accurate picture of what the, the domestic side of Montesuka Pinal looked like. And that's right on the South Fork, right over Polo Grounds Road. Nobody knows it's there. Our strategy for identifying it is not signage because it's private land. There's no protection. And there's a lot of crazy people out there who say, you know, Hammond always says they didn't bury their dead with valuables, but let's go out with a couple of shovels and figure that out. So um, you really have to know where it is. But Sakup is played seven days a week out there, and the site is preserved on both sides of the right hand, which was not entrenched as deep as it is today. The next slide, please. Um, I got to pick up the pace if we're going to uh, get to the Seminole Trail. Uh, the artifacts are from the 17th century. These are arrow points. They came out of that dark level. John Smith and all the colonists at Jamestown say, every morning we wake up and we find these little triangular darts in our palisade. They look just like that. Most of them from local courts, one made from uh, a dark stone chert or flint that came out of the mountains. Uh, those points get smaller and smaller through time. That's what this is illustrating. Those are less than one to two centimeters. Uh, and that means by association with radiocarbon dates and other digs, that means that village was lived in until about 1700. So I wanted to make the guess right till 1730. It was Peter Jefferson's move to town. Ambrose Madison going to Orange County, the Monacans saw the writing on the wall, and this was the end. This is the last stage of Montesuco. On the next slide, the pottery is not, you know, the Metropolitan Museum is not calling me. Please send me examples. Please send me a whole pot. Their art was, you know, their art and their ritual took other means. Pottery is not spectacular, but this, this kind of uh, indentation in the clay. The punctation and the decoration is very, it's 17th century, absolutely. And it's found from Iroquois, upstate New York, all the way down through North Carolina. And it's a firm, when, when they started making pottery like this, uh, across cultural boundaries, they made this kind of decoration. It's locally made, but it affects, it has a decoration that puts it into the 18th century, into the early 1700s. Next one, please. Um, at, this, at this place on the South Fork, um, Monacan, a Monacan leader sadly passed away a few years ago, Karen Wood. Some of you may have known her. Good friend, died all too soon. Um, we went to work and 
road on the highway, historic highway marker to note the site. Uh, it's not easy to write 100, for two people to write 100 words. You can only put 100 words on one of these markers. But we did, and care, just the kind of collaboration we have, I might have said, okay, blah, 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 here's this village, this village of John Smith, Amarillo, and, and then the last sentence says, Monacan descendants still reside throughout Central Virginia. Their headquarters today is in Bear Mountain in Amherst County. And I, I, you know, when I gave Karen a draft of 100 words, she said, all right, all the action, when we write these, all the action is going to be on the Monacan side. Amarolic confronted John Smith. Amarolic told John Smith. And every sign in Outside of Alan Marl Charleston, there are many signs about Monacan history. They all end. This was Karen saying to me, you know, we, we honor this historic spot. This is the only chance we have to educate the public at present. Every sign should say we're still here. But we moved to Bear Mountain in Africa. So that's what you see there. It's, it was a very, you know, I kept learning in my collaboration with them. The next one, please. Uh, Monarchan people did not disappear, but their name was taken from them. And that's who would, if you'll give me a little past six, I'll get into it. Okay. Um, so this is one of the first land grants. This is the Meriwether land grant, 1745. It's a little fuzzy, but you can see there's a red arrow pointing to a significant spot on the landscape here in eastern Albemarle. It's Indian fields. And that's what starts happening. Peter Jefferson and Ambrose Madison, the cars, all the families you know, kept records, made maps. They stopped saying Monica. It's a way of erasing, it's a racial. And Indian people all across, actually colonized people all around the world know when that happens. It's, it's a, it's a devastating moment. Um, today, you go into a subdivision built in the 1990s, and every street is named for the Hopi, the Navajo, the Apache, helicopters, you know, military things, or jeeps, and, you know, we use Indian names. They didn't honor people. European colonists did not honor Indian people by naming places. Not here in the Piedmont. They did in, in 1600, they did. That's why there are places like Rappahannock, Patawomeck, Potomac River, the Algonquin term Patawomeck. They did use it, but by 1700, 1730, 1750, in Albemarle, they used the generic. And when they say this place is an Indian, we call this place Indian Fields, they call it that because it is an Indian field. But the Indians had left, probably within the last months or years, but it's still recognizably cleared space, cleared for Indian planting. I don't have the maps, but there's some very famous places in our county. Morgan, the original name is Indian Camp. Jefferson and William Short have lengthy correspondence about what became Morgan, and it's always referred to as Indian Camp. Why did they call it? They could have called it Monarchy Camp. They didn't. They made it generic. And, you know, these wandering people, these savages, they're just all about the countryside. So this land that became Mormon, you know, which is extraordinarily, obviously now wealthy, and was a, a rich area into the mountains, away from the James, uh, what became Mormon is, without question, was Indian camp. Why? Because Indians lived there. And they used the term camp instead of town or village as a way of dismissing. We didn't displace these people. They didn't have a name and they lived in camps, like a Boy Scout troop in a weekend. No. Archaeology has been done there in Mormon. People lived there for thousands of years. It deserves better. At Monticello, at the Tufton Quarter, um, Jefferson refers to it as Indian fields. Why? Because they were Indian fields. When he dug the mound, he said, it's located right across the South Fork of the Ravana from the remains of an Indian town. He wasn't, 
he would he wouldn't recognize broken pottery and broken stone tools as a town. And that tells me I can't prove this, but in Indian town, he must have been looking at the remnants of uh, sapling and thatch houses, cleared fields. He knew there'd been Indian town there. And he says that. He just doesn't use the word monarchy, and neither did his father. Jefferson also never mentions his mother in his writings. I like to point this out. Only when she died, he wrote to an uncle in Scotland and said, mother has passed somewhere. That's the only time. And yet we know Jefferson had a mother. So the, these guys, these, these colonists could be so tricky in what they say and what they don't say. The next one, please. Um, all too quick, but in Jefferson's classic work, Notes on the State of Virginia, he talks about the mound, he talks about the town, and then he has this recollection, which I'm going to have to pass through all too quickly. He ends his discussion of the mound by saying when he was a young man, he witnessed a group of Indians. Not Monacans, doesn't give the name, but he witnessed a group of Indians make their way through the woods directly to the mound to carry out sorrowful ceremonies. This is Jefferson's personal copy from the UVA uh, small archive, Albert Small archive. And um, in his own hand, always contradictory, Jefferson is dismissing the Monacans, doesn't give them their name, digs up their ancestors, puts them back in the ground. But when he writes about the mound and what he saw there, he, this is Greek. This is Jefferson's knowledge of Greek. And he says, man, the way these people buried their dead is much like the way the Greeks buried their dead. These are really sophisticated people. That, of course, comparing them to Greek burial practices was a high compliment from this class. Just and that's Jefferson's own hand. I'm very, this has been published long ago. And honestly, I don't get a penny out of this, but if there's anything I ever published that's been like, has legs, as they say on Broadway, and just never goes away, it's this. Everybody loves this. And I'm happy that they love this. And the conflicts of how to look at Jefferson's dick. But the Greek and the, observ the ethnographic observation and the fact that he dug the mound, and then he, after he knew, he dug it after he observed this ritual visit to the mound. So science, bones, they all had different meanings in those days. <clears throat> Worth talking about, not right now. I think I only have one or two more slides. Yikes. Just to bring it to the present day, this work, Jefferson uh, in Notes on the State of Virginia said, well, um, the only time he mentioned the Monicans, he basically wrote their obituary. He said, oh, they're not going to last. Neither are the Nottaway, neither are the Pamunkey, neither are the, all the Indian tribes are in their last gasp. And they're going to die out. They're going to join with the Tuscarora. They're going to join with the Catawba. They won't be heard from again. Virginia is out. He doesn't say that, but the implication. Well, he was wrong. So there was a wonderful moment where Monacan leaders came, joined with me in the rotunda, which was packed out the doors as far as you could see. And the Monacan people in Jefferson's rotunda talked about their culture and their history and their struggles at that time. And there could be no more symbolic evidence for a tribe now numbering 2,100 uh, that Jefferson was wrong. They didn't, they were at a very low ebb in the 1780s uh, demographically, but they're back and they're the largest tribe in Virginia. And the work we've done is now part of the politics. That's Vicki Ferguson, a Monacan leader, uh, obviously talking to Governor Northam about uh, how concerned the tribe is about the chiefest town of Grasswick just this year. So, you know, it's about the past and it's about the present. The next one, I think. So that's Monacan history. That's Monacan ancestral territory. Can I steal 10 minutes? Um, and how do we recognize it here in Charlottesville and Albemarle? We, 
we recognize it by naming everything we can in Seminole. Seminole Trail. Here's, of course, the most important junctures where the Seminole Lane meets the Seminole Trail. This was the sacred place of the Seminoles where they attended uh, Nancy B's House of Lights. No disrespect to Nancy B. But, you know, I took these pictures just weeks ago. This is the landscape that is about, that ignores the mountains and honors the Seminole tribe of Florida. So, what the hell? And that's what I really wanted to talk about. So in a few minutes, let me speak to this. Yeah, we're done. Thank goodness. Oh, no, one more. The print, but you don't have to read it right now. Oh, okay. So who are the Seminoles? And why are they everywhere still in, in northern Albemarle in the city of Charlottesville? And that one highway sign that said Monica Town, well, that got taken off for safety reasons. It got taken off the main highway and it's now on the side road, Rio Mills Road, where it's viewed by, I would guess, somewhere between two and three people per year, maybe, if I remember to go. Uh, so nobody sees it. There's really nothing that says Monica. Who are the Seminoles? They're Florida-based. They have no problem telling you they're Florida-based. Everything I'm going to show you about the Seminoles is from Seminoles' own website in their history. The Seminoles were part of the groups, five Indian nations that Andrew Jackson forced into removal into the Oklahoma territories. What's significant is that contrary to popular belief, a lot of Native people from Virginia Florida said, we're not leaving. And they didn't. So there's some, this area here is where Seminole stayed behind. Then they moved to the Everglades. They moved further south, always avoiding the gaze of the colonial powers. But they, a lot of Seminoles didn't leave, and a lot of Seminoles did leave. So today there are two Seminole tribes, one in Oklahoma and one in Florida. They don't always get along. Um, but their history is quite joined up until the 1830s when Andrew Jackson splits them up. I want to point out Pensacola because uh, there's a good reason. Just note Pensacola and how far it is from Seminole country. Next slide. So I'm concerned with the absence of Monica in reference and the prevalence of seminal references on Route 29 in Albemarle and Charlottesville. And historically, actually, all of Route 29 from Southern Maryland down to here, Pensacola. Now, most anyone who's ever thought about this, and this is in many Seaville articles, Daily Progress articles, Washington Post articles, honest to God, it's and so many people say, why is the name Seminole in Charlottesville? And, uh, you know, in the 1920s, there was a big land boom in Florida. And I think it was named the Seminole Trail because this was the way to get to the Seminole country, where the wealth was. Well, the wealth was in Miami. That's where the developers were. And the Seminole, Route 29, the Seminole Trail went to Pensacola. And then nobody in Pensacola. <laughs> There's no Monicans, there's no Seminoles. There's no connection between these people. And neither tribe would argue that there is. Who are the Seminoles? There are people who are the uh, descendants of the Creek and the Catawba and the Mississippian mound builders who were devastated by Spanish colonialism. And in a process, anthropologists, historians, geographers call ethnogenesis, the people who survived the disease, the slavery, the wars, coalesced. Creek Indians, Catawba Indians, um, Calusa Indians, they co coalesced with <laughs> Pensacola, where Route 29. They coalesced here in the Everglades and tried to stay below uh, site because Andrew Jackson was coming after them. And that's when they named themselves collectively Seminoles. 
You won't find reference to Seminoles in 16th or 17th century documents. It's it's a form, and there's nothing wrong. It's it's um, it's the genus. Let's reconvene and figure out who we are. Let's put the tribes together and take this new name. Next one, and then. So the road that goes from really Washington, D.C., Arlington, a little bit into Maryland, to Pensacola, where no developers were building anything in the 1920s. That road is named the Seminole Trail. And this will be the, the only text to really dwell on. In February of 1928, the General Assembly passed Senate Bill 64, which says, be it enacted, blah, 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 through the state of Virginia from to the North Carolina line, that's where they had authority, Danville, Chatham, Methodist, Lynchburg, Amherst, Charlottesville, Madison, Culpeper to Warrington, is hereby designated and shall be here after known as the Seminole Trail. Um, I've been here 40 years, and for 40 years, this struck me right away. What the hell? It's every time a football team comes up from Florida State, they think, look how they're honoring us. <laughs> Why did that come about? Our former basketball coach, Dave Lato, was really angry about that. So why is it the Seminole Trail? Well, here's the answer. The Senate passed the bill and named it the Seminole Trail. Why? There's not an ounce of explanation. We're going to skip the next three slides. But the next three slides I have for you were the language in the General Assembly notes from 1922 to 1928, every time a road was named for Patrick Henry, for James Madison, and for Jeb Stewart, and for Robert E. Lee, the Lee Highway that runs Route 50 through Arlington. All those roads, this is the era where roads had to be built and they had to be connected. Like, Okay, it wasn't farm to market anymore, and this was in across the state and interstate. So there had to be some agreement about names. And Route 29 gets called uh, the Seminole Highway, the Seminole Trail. And then that name is gone everywhere except Charlottesville and Northern Albemarle. Um, every one of the other places, the Confederate generals, the Patriots from the Revolution are the documents I'm sparing you uh, are long whereas statements. Whereas it is the process of the Commonwealth to honor those who built, where, who served the Confederacy. Whereas the United Daughters of the Confederacy sought to honor Jeb Stewart, sought to honor Robert E. Lee. Uh, we and then the whereas is go on and on. Give me liberty, give me death. So we honor Patrick Henry, who was born not far and died not far, is buried not far. Long explanations. It's fine, great. James Madison. If there's anybody who didn't need a long explanation, I would guess James Madison. But the Seminole Highway. What do they say? Crickets. <laughs> Once again, Indian Field. Seminole Highway. Don't ask me why. I don't even know the, who proposed it, but there it is. So for so long, people have said, I'm going to take 10 pages I just wrote for you guys today, but it's time to move on. Um, I'm going to publish, I hope to publish this. I hope I'm putting it out now to get some feedback and work. I am talking to the Board of Supervisors and historian, other historians who deal with highway histories, which is, is a very rich field, actually. Why, why, why? And everybody goes, well, you know, the land boom. You know, it's the Florida land boom. Everybody, so the idea was name it the Central Highway, and, and that'll draw tourists and Model T drivers that want to get down to the land boom in Miami to take 29. Everybody went except nobody knew the Seminole War, and the, tr the road went to Pensacola. So when they got to the end of the road, they bought a burger and a Coke and had to turn around because the land in Miami by 1924 was already bought out. Um, so there was a, this phrase we use, 
the land boom of the 1920s, it seems simple enough, but it wasn't the 1920s. The boom began in sort of 1918, and by 1925, it was over. Flag, a man named Flagler, you may know, created Flagler University, built the railroads. Flagler got rich, I mean, Davis got rich, few people got rich, they were in early, they bought up plots of land, they sold them at inflated prices. A hurricane hit in late 25, 26, sunk a schooner that was supposed to be turned into a luxury hotel that was in the Miami Harbor, sunk the schooner, railroads couldn't travel, people couldn't get into the harbor, the boom was over, over. 1925, 19, February 1926, absolutely dead, absolutely dead. The Seminoles, though, had been part of an effort by the state of Florida to promote the tourism generally in Florida, but they met Miami and the Everglades. Come here because the wildest people of Indian ancestry still live here and in the language of eugenics. Unlike the Indians of Virginia, the Monicans, the Pamunkey, the Rappahannock, the Chickahominy, unlike our Indians, the Seminoles are pure. They're pure bloods. They've maintained their ancient ways. Come see them. Come see them because they're threatening, but they're safe. It's, it's exciting, it's like visiting old West Town. And I'm spare, I have all the promotional documents, drawings. They converted hotels and, to make them look like Italian villas. They put canals out front with gondolas. Come to Miami, it's a little, it's like Epcot is where it was. It's a little bit like Italy. And there on the shores of the Miami basin is a family of Seminole Indians looking on. A mother, a baby, and her husband, the husband father, who has a rifle. So, domestic, peaceful, threatening. Come, we'll protect you. Take the train, drive the Model T down. No, don't take the train because the trains are all packed up. They've been embarked. Take a ship. No, don't take the ship. You can't get in anymore. And I, just give me this one because they're one of my heroes, the Marx Brothers. In 1925, George S. Kaufman, humorist, uh, great intellectual of the New York Algonquin Circle, George S. Kaufman and the Marx Brothers sat down together and wrote a brilliant play and musical called Coconuts. It was later made into one of the first talking films, but it was a Broadway show in 1925. And everything about it mocked the Florida land boom. Groucho played a hotel owner who was trying to convince a wealthy dowager who was brought down from New England to buy worthless land for millions of dollars. Chico and Harpo were grifters. That's, their, that's what they're called in the script. And everybody knew. Everybody knew. And, and, and the play played in New York. And the Marx Brothers, who were, came out of the vaudeville circuit, took it around the country between 1925 and 1927. Everybody knew. And the land boom was a national joke. Six months after the Marx Brothers closed the road show, they came back to New York, played for two weeks, and then they shut down later, made into the film. Six months after the show closed, the Virginia General Assembly passed a bill, State Senate Bill 64, to honor the Seminole Indians to encourage, theoretically, Virginians to move to Florida, to invest in Florida. It makes no sense. Except if, you know, Pocahontas was being honored in those years, some few Pamunkey leaders were invited to the governor's mansion to make a gift of tribute to the governor a little bit of honoring of certain Indians, but no honor for the Monicans, no highway name for the monkey, no highway name for the Chickahominy, just the opposite. Virginia Indians 
in the mindset of eugenics were not pure, they were mixed bloods. In the ugliest term, they were mongrels. And the book was written as a foundation of American eugenic theory called Mongrel Genius. It's about the Monicans and it's hurtful to this day. Um, so I'm wrapping up now because there's other business and you may have questions. I'm sorry, I went a little uh, very long. That's, there is a Monacan ancestral territory. It's recognized in Charlottesville and Albemarle only by signs that say Seminole. Now, personally, I don't care if those signs stay up. That's not the issue. Um, I, that's for other people to decide. But what's stopping us, what's stopping the county, the historical society, the board of supervisors, what's the academics? What's stopping us from covering the university? The university has nothing on mind. For all the talk of outreach, nothing. They hosted us in the rotunda. Now they're doing a little more. The county, tell, explain this one to me. The county agreed to change Route 29 Southern Albemarle to the Monacan Trail. But Charlottesville, they said, mm, too expensive to get all those business, all the businesses to change their station on the camera. What a nuisance. Weigh that against 400 years of racism and discrimination against the Monacans. And what needs to be said to recognize the true ancestral people of the region. Um, you know, in our, you can pick up the newspaper on the same day and you can see that Arlington and Fairfax and uh, Alexandria, without hesitation, say, we're changing the name of the Lee Highway change in the name of Judge Stewart Highway and Jefferson Davis Highway is being changed. And all those people who have businesses or homes along the path will be expected within the next six months to have a change of address submitted to the Postal Service. Now, what happens then? I don't know. In the current situation, I don't know. But nobody else sweated it. And now in Albemarle and Charlottesville, for reasons I have not been able to get anyone to tell me or find minutes about uh, we went the other way. And so Charlottesville, the University of Virginia, and Northern Albemarle continue the honoring of the Seminole people. Get on their website. I'm not reading it to you. I was planning to. They make no claim to have ever been in Virginia. It's not in their interest. They're very busy. They own the entire chain of hard rock cafes. They work very close to the Florida State University. They got their own life. And, and yeah, they do. They do own casinos. And the Monicans are not, in, the Monicans just opened a health center and a senior citizen center. They're using their federal money differently. But uh, yeah, Florida, the Florida Seminoles did as many tribes did. What are they, they got thrown out of the Everglades. They, I mean, they had to drain the Everglades to make Miami part of it. And that's where the Seminoles live. There's no love lost. The Seminoles weren't themselves were not writing the advertising copy for the Seminole Highway. It was white developers, and they used the Seminoles. The Seminoles, what other source of income did they have? They had, they did alligator wrestling. Back in the day, alligator wrestling was a big draw. They created living history villages at New York, World's Fair, 1939. They had one at the Chicago World's Exposition in 1933. Uh, they had many places. They, they became a tourist attraction in Florida. They did, and that was a source of income. And when you read today, the children of the people who were in those towns, those touristy spots, and they sold crafts and beautiful clothing, baskets, very typical American scene in the 1920s. But the bitterness towards being relocated by Andrew Jackson, split up by Andrew Jackson, and then thrown out of the Everglades. Uh, they worked those jobs, but they worked them in anger, frankly. And there was no other source of anger. When casinos became legal, yeah, they went that way. Big time. Big time. And successfully. So I'll stop there. I think it's a complete mystery. But I think it's we should change it. I'll do what I can. But I don't. There's a Commonwealth Transportation Board. 
if the board of supervisors says let's do this it can be done so i'd like to see the city and the university follow suit i haven't done it all yet i just wanted to share that with the society hopefully get your support some of that thank you oh, I appreciate it. Oh, maybe a couple questions if there are any. Anything on that? Um, I know I'm going to miss a bunch. I'm just going to go to the Q and A box here. Tom, I can't quit. Yeah. Um, okay. Are there any Monacan names of places rivers left in the county? No. Um, it just was as much as the Jamestown colonists. Did that all the time. The Monacans, because the Monacan stayed in the area and traded and thought they'd become allies with English, so they named they, their language was appropriated for the name place, the naming places. As I said, by 1730, 1750, the Monacan, the Monacans were very different than the Monacans in that they said we don't. We see the English, we see you people as the people who came from under the world to take our world from us. And they didn't share the names of places. They didn't tell them about the mountains. Uh, and consequently, the, and, and the 18th century Piedmont settlers, first Piedmont settlers had no interest in honoring the names or even acknowledging the names. And that uh, the earliest comprehensive history of Albemarle is a good one written by Moore. I can't remember his first name. Yep. Uh, and in it, he has a sentence that, given the absence of lyrical Indian words, it is obvious that the Indians have long since abandoned this region. And that's not true. And I have kind of used him as a straw man in the early 20th century. But the absence of lyrical Indian words tell me about Thomas Jefferson's mother. And, you know, mm -hmm. the, the obvious way people had of not mentioned them. So, no, there are not any uh, indigenous names in the region. Very briefly, um, um, uh, amateur and um, Relatively, relatively new transplant, but um, have just to, you know just become fascinated um, because of what is so obviously still here in so many places, um, and I'm also working with um, with children who are so interested in this history and right. uh, come into it through Arrowheads. Um, but what I found because they have they have been here for so long, um, I've I've seen um, and found um, stone, highly worked and aesthetic stone, um, most likely associated with ritual or spiritual life uh, and printed, um, you know, one wing bird, um, um, things along those lines in, in, in multiple places, especially I, I live near Licking Hole Creek now. Hey, um, that's and where just, the monarch and yeah, I think that there was, yeah, it's still here. And so in, in light of the name change and things like that, or or the, the very large possible marking treaty um, on 250 at the Episcopalian church, you know, these kind of living things that I talk about with, with children, um, just making the culture come to life more. Um, but if I could, those things exist, some of them are real, some of them right, can't maybe. tell. Yeah. But you know how long it takes to get to a bare mountain in Amherst County where the Monica Museum, now that they're federally recognized as funds pouring in, yes. the museum is modernizing, there's people who give COVID is the limit. Once that hopefully exactly. eases up, they welcome visitors. But they, because of the attitude of the colonists, they did move away. But it's 60 minutes yeah. and God, it's a beautiful. Yeah, I'm excited. Right. Yeah. Really? That's what I'm right. This time of year. Yeah. Like bringing the culture alive to, well, their museum, know, to support the endeavor of, of respecting the needs. And it, their museum includes the one room log cabin schoolhouse that was restored 
because they were neither black nor white, and then this, there's nothing worse in categories from in the Bible to racial categories, nothing worse than being in between Mongol and mixed. And the Monarchans carried that label and they were not able to attend what were then called colored schools or the white schools. So um, Episcopal missions uh, and Episcopal <laughs> and other denomination uh, missionaries came and built one-room schoolhouses and sent teachers. Man my age, Kenneth Branham, who's the chief of the tribe, my age, he went to that school through the eighth grade. And after that, no school. They, they couldn't go to high school unless they went to Pembroke, North Carolina, unless they left their families and attended boarding schools, which we know were not pleasant. So it's a very sad history. But the Monaghans, as people do, they turn this log cabin, um, they helped restore it. We put it on the National Register of Historic Places. It's the only non, uh, you know, Jefferson, it's the only non uh, Palladian, um, uh, it's the only place in Amherst County that's listed on the register that isn't a uh, 19th century mansion with column, white columns. And they're very proud of that. I am too. It's worth this. And, and that's just part of it. Then there's artifacts. Bring them your artifacts. You can send me a photograph, send me a PDF. Outside. Yeah. Most of the time, I say, I, I, I can't tell. <laughs> yeah. But please, uh, and to any other chats, well, thank you very I much. Oh, can I plug that in there? You certainly can. What is that again? My last name at Virginia. And I'll try to get to it. Sorry, no problem. Thank you very much. A great time. Uh, definitely want to uh, um, look at the uh, changes from uh, Monacan, the naming, uh, and I think that they make a very valid case about Seminole not making any sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you very much, all everyone here to join us. Uh, remember, if we have the Seville PD event afterwards, we want to uh, went a little bit over, but we want to uh, head over to the computer lab. Um, our speaker series brought to you by the Historical Society. Thanks for all your wonderful support. Uh, everything we do is your Historical Society is because of your support. Thank you, uh, Professor Hampman, Northside Library, um, Evan for manning the technology. Um, I'm Tom Chapman, and we'll see you next uh, for our next speaker series. Till then, stay safe and support local history. Thank you very much. Thank you.